<laughs> That's one, Dave. <laughs> yeah, I was watching the countdown on the uh, live stream. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize we were there already. Hi. <laughs> this is amateur radio, and it's kind of amateur night, Tuesday night. Uh, but it's uh, time for an amateur radio class, uh, our extra class. Uh, so happy to have you with us, whether you're uh, in our Zoom classroom. We've got about 13 folks there. Uh, and uh, on YouTube, we've got uh, 17 people. Uh, but you are the most important one because you're, you're watching. Uh, and you're watching for a reason because you want to upgrade from a general class or advanced class uh, up to extra class, and hopefully we're going to help you do that. Um, we're going to be talking about Chapter 9 tonight, and uh, I would like to show this is uh, the book that we use, the American Radio Relay League License Manual, 12th edition, uh, and uh, we go chapter by chapter in this book uh, and uh, cover all of the test questions that you would uh, need to know uh, before you take your uh, amateur radio extra class test uh, to uh, get to the pinnacle uh, of amateur radio licensing in the United States. So uh, we'll be uh, going ahead and uh, uh, starting on uh, antennas and feed lines tonight. But uh, before we do, um, I just want to say that it's got to be confusing. It's got to be baffling. It's got to be hard. Uh, all of this new material that is coming at you in this class. And so we totally appreciate that. And um, undoubtedly, you know, there are questions that you're going to have. Uh, we open ourselves up to, to answer any questions that you might have either by email um, or you can give me a call on the phone um, or we'll get in contact somehow. But in the classroom tonight, are there any questions from any of you about anything that we've covered so far? If so, just go ahead and unmute. Okay, well, um, so we will go, oh, go ahead, John, you unmuted? I, you know, I think one of the, one of the difficulties I'm having is as I move along the chapters, I go back to the beginning and it's almost like relearning it all again because it's so voluminous. It, it, do you recommend a constant review? Or, or yes, and in, in fact, if, if you look in the introductory, the chapter one uh, class, I think that was in chapter one or was it chapter two? Um, we talked about the best ways of learning, and yes, repetitive review um, is the best way to get your mind to long-term remember all of the material. Um, so, it seems in technician in general, you could kind of move through it and do it in a couple of weeks, but this is big. <laughs> yeah, the, the extra class has, has many more questions, and it's a longer test. Uh, for technician in general, the two lower classes uh, uh, of licensing, it's 35 questions. For the amateur extra, you have to take a 50-question test. So um, it, is, it is harder, and that's why we spend more time. Uh, the other classes are 10 weeks long. We spend 17 weeks uh, on this class. And if you go to your local ham club, okay, we're getting a little off target here, but you go to your local ham club and you talk to the older hams, they'll say, oh man, you've got it so easy now. <laughs> it doesn't seem that way, but um, it's true that back in the day, they had to do a lot of you know, more things. They had to do the Morse code requirement, um, uh, up to 20 words per minute. Uh, sometimes sending, sometimes receiving, depending on the era. Uh, and then they also had to uh, answer questions. Some of them were, uh, were written, uh, diagrams, things like that they had to do. Uh, so it has changed uh, over the years. But it's the system that we have right now with volunteer examiners on the multiple choice test. And we want to get you uh, ready to go uh, uh, so that you're, you're prepared uh, to take the test and pass. I appreciate everything. You betcha. Happy to do it. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the first question I want to ask is why? Why are we doing all of this? Uh, well, in, in my case, uh, an answer for that has to do with you know operating and operating with friends and people, and sometimes you get rewarded. Uh, so. Um, uh, Fred Pinson, K4RM, uh, has a uh, mountain house 
uh, that he has uh, turned over to a bunch of us that we uh, operate from. It's at about 3,500 uh, feet above sea level. It's uh, way up there. Um, and so we operated in the uh, IARU High Frequency World Championship back in July. Uh, we scored uh, 840,000 points in that. Uh, we were the first place in the North Carolina section, the first place in the Roanoke, a section for our a multiple operator single transmitter uh, category and 10th place in zone 8. So um, that's one of the reasons uh, why I'm a ham radio operator to have this kind of fun. It's also one of the reasons why we build antennas. Another was this one. We just most recently back in, um, when was it, October, uh, operated in the CQ Worldwide DX contest, the single sideband version. We had 3,700,000 points, uh, and we were number one in the fourth call area in the multi-operator single transmitter category. And so the antennas that were put up there, he's got a, a multi-band Yagi antenna, but then wire antennas for uh, 80 meters and 40 meters and 160 meters. Uh, he has beverage antennas for receiving uh, a long distance. Uh, all of those things factored into the success uh, of that operation. So tonight we're going to talk about antennas. We're going to get started anyway. We'll talk about sections 9.1 and 9.2 in the book. Um, and I have to say that we, we do try to keep a tight focus on the test. Uh, this is not going to be a comprehensive class about antennas. We don't have the time. But we will try to give you all of the information that you need to know uh, for uh, the upcoming test. So um, before we actually get into section 9.1, though, I'd like to go into a little bit of review. This is kind of an introduction uh, to chapter 9. Um, and you may find this useful. <laughs> you might not, uh, but hopefully you will. So impedance, we talk about it. Let me turn on my laser pointer here. Uh, impedance is the combination, it's the opposition to AC current flow uh, through the combination of resistance and reactants, uh, and that reactants could be inductive reactants like we see here, or it could be capacitive reactants. So, you know, that's impedance. Here we have it looking in, in a polar uh, uh, notation as far as um, um, the uh, resistance uh, and the uh, in, uh, reactants and, and the corresponding impedance value. And we go back to well, what do you think this is? This is Ohm's law from the, the technician class. And I want to point out that there is an Ohm's law for impedance. It doesn't strictly work out the way uh, that uh, Ohm's law for resistance works out because of the, the changing phase angle of the reactants. But in general, Ohm's law for AC circuits, the impedance is equal to the ratio of the voltage to the current. That's what I want you to be thinking about. Think of impedance as a ratio. Uh, it's the ratio of voltage to, to current in a circuit. Okay, Gary, where are you trying to go with this? Well, um, so let's say we look at the output of a, your, your uh, transceiver. Uh, we can use the Ohm's law for impedance. Uh, and if you know that the output of your transceiver is a 50 ohm output, which is the, the typical, um, and if you have one amp of AC current, well, then you know that the voltage is going to be um, impedance times current or 50 volts. The ratio of um, uh, voltage to current is going to be 50 uh, at the output of your uh, amateur radio transceiver. Uh, and that is corresponds also to a power level of 50 watts. So if you've got 100 watts going out, it's going to be 2 amps of current. So 50 ohm impedance has a ratio of 50 to 1 as far as voltage to current. Now some antennas uh, are 600 ohms. Uh, in this case, if you have 1 amp of current and 600 ohms impedance, well it's going to be 600 volts. Uh, at that point, and uh, with a 600 watts uh, going into the circuit. It's that ratio idea that when we talk about high impedance, let's say 600 ohms, we'll, we'll call it a semi-high impedance, or 50 ohms, lower impedance, we're really talking about 
the voltage to current ratio. So when you hear impedance, I, I want you to be thinking about that. We always say that you want to have a matched uh, impedance from the source to the load that gives you the maximum transfer of power. Uh, for 50 ohm impedance, it's going to be a 50 to 1 ratio. Where this comes in is with antennas. And here we have the RF current distribution on an 80 meter half wave dipole. So this is the current distribution. And you notice that the current distribution is maximum, at the highest point, at the midpoint of a half wave dipole antenna. And as you move your way out from the center, the current is de decreasing. Again, moving away from the center, the current is decreasing. So we could say that this is the lowest impedance point on this antenna because it has the highest current value. Um, and uh, we can look at this dynamically here also. Um, it has also to do with the voltage. This is the minimum voltage point in a half wave dipole antenna. The maximum voltage point is out at the ends of the antenna. We could say that this is the lowest impedance point to feed this antenna, whereas the ends are the highest impedance point because they have the highest voltage to current ratio at the ends. And you can find feed lines of all sorts of different types. Um, uh, they have a characteristic impedance, 50 ohms or 300 ohms or 600 ohms. We'll talk more about feed lines uh, as we go along. My whole point of this uh, voltage to current idea think, with impedance is to just kind of plant a seed with you uh, to give you something to think about uh, as we talk more about antennas, uh, off-center fed dipoles, for example, and why we feed them at a place other than the center of an antenna. Or if you talk about end-fed antennas, why you have to have a, a transformer to uh, in, go from 50 ohms up to a very high impedance because you're feeding at a voltage point on an end-fed uh, half-wave dipole. All right. Now we will begin with section 9.1. The plan is to take, uh, uh, go through 9.1, uh, review the questions also, then we'll take a break and we'll come back and do section 9.2 uh, in the last half of the class. So I got a, some emails from more than one student about isotropic radiators. Uh, what the heck is this? Uh, and so an isotropic radio, radiator or, or antenna uh, is what we call a point source. Think of it as this orange point here in the middle of the sphere. And RF radiation radiates from this point equally well in all directions. Doesn't matter which direction you go, the output is the same. This is a reference antenna, an isotropic antenna or isotropic radiator. You can't build these. This is different than an omnidirectional antenna, by the way. We'll, we'll talk about those as well. But um, an isotropic radiator is just a theoretical concept that uh, physicists use uh, when they're looking at energy distribution. You can't build these because of reflections, reflections from the Earth, reflections from objects, even in space. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a no-go, but it is a good theoretical concept, the isotropic antenna. Well, what if I went into space and had a dipole antenna? Well, it has a different shape than we're used to seeing. This uh, dipole antenna, you can see the antenna here in the middle, uh, it, uh, it is radiating in a kind of an egg shape. Uh, the nulls are off the end of the dipole antenna. So this is a dipole antenna in free space. If we overlay these two antennas, here's the isotropic, the sphere, Here's the dipole, the egg, and you see in this one direction, it goes out farther. And that represents gain in that direction only, but it represents gain in that direction or in this direction over an isotropic spherical antenna. So we say that a dipole has almost twice, uh, 3 dB would be a twice, but 
2.15 dB um, gain over an isotropic radiator. You need to know that number, 2.15. That's the difference between an isotropic and a dipole antenna. A dipole antenna has more gain. When we add the Earth to a dipole antenna uh, that was in free space, we were looking at it before, you can see that the pattern, the egg, flattens out uh, considerably. Um, but we do have maximum radiation broadside. This is the dipole, I'm going at a kind of 45 degree angle. Maximum radiation is broadside to the dipole antenna. Uh, and if we uh, look top down on that, you can see this is the kind of pattern uh, that you would see. Uh, you don't see the sharp nulls necessarily at the end, uh, but you do see it more directionality broadside to the antenna. If we look sideways uh, to the antenna, this is the, an elevation pattern. Uh, and uh, so you'll see uh, that uh, some of the energy comes and, and goes up. This is the maximum uh, lobe uh, and comes back down. So this is an elevation pattern for a dipole antenna. Does anyone remember what the impedance of a center-fed dipole antenna is? Anybody want to unmute and give it a guess? 50. Well, okay, so we feed the antennas with 50 ohm coax commonly, but no, that is not the impedance at the center of a dipole antenna. Uh, the impedance right here is about 73 ohms. Uh, that's the, the rule of th thumb. 73 ohms is the, the center point impedance, uh, which is pretty close to 50 ohms, and so you can get a, a, a pretty good match. Notice here that the, it's the maximum current point, that's the blue. See, the current uh, is changing in polarity, but its uh, amplitude is max here at the center. Uh, the voltage is max out at the ends. So, here I'm putting up my antenna, and I, I can't get it... Go ahead. That would change too, depending on the height, right? Yeah. <laughs> Look at the next slide. Yes. This is what I call the most important slide to, to know about. Now, this is over theoretical ground. Um, there are, you can find this uh, also with the real ground, and it's not quite as pronounced. But here over, um, this is the height in wavelengths, how high up the antenna is off the ground. So here's a half wavelength above the, the ground. Here's one wavelength above the ground. And here is the radiation resistance in ohms of that antenna. And note that over a theoretical ground, uh, if you got it way down low, you might have an impedance of only around 10 ohms. But as you raise the antenna up, note there's 50 ohms. You raise the antenna up even more, note that it's like 85 ohms. You raise it up, what is it, 100 ohms. And the more you raise it now here, it's going to come back down. And then you raise it up even more, it goes back up. Notice what this is regressing to a mean. It's, it's, it's coming down to 73 ohms. That's, that's the average impedance. But you may find that um, the impedance of the dipole antenna that you put up is going to vary greatly by how high you put it up. So a lot of people are really concerned about putting the antenna up and, and trimming the antenna, which can have an impact as far as the, the length of the antenna uh, and the resonant point of the antenna. But the actual impedance may be impacted more by how high up it is. So just keep that in mind. Gary, did sea level have anything to do with that? Uh, it has to do with the way the antenna will radiate, but it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with its uh, feed uh, point impedance. So it, the, the, it's relative to where you're actually transmitting from. Yes, and, and also ground conductivity is going to have a, an impact. So maybe the, the, at sea level you'd have better ground conductivity. We'll, we'll talk more about that here in, in just a minute. So, yeah, quick question. Yeah. Um, just curiosity. I, I sit at 10,000 feet and we go up to 14,000 here. Is, is that a significant factor in it? Or no? we, it is a significant factor in the way the antenna will radiate out uh, for uh, distant contacts. And, and we'll talk more about that here in just a second. That has to do with terrain. 
Uh, and uh, yeah, you, you're at a great advantage being up high. So <laughs> yeah, put your thumbs up. Yeah, we'd all like to be that. So I explained um, the isotropic radiator and uh, a, a dipole antenna uh, in an email to one of our students here as a balloon. And I think this diagram kind of looks you know, like that. So if we have a balloon uh, and we blow it up with a certain volume of air, it's going to be pretty much spherical, all right? But if we take that same balloon and we squish it down from the top, um, even by maybe running some string, drawing some string through here, um, you'll, it would go out farther um, in, in a, a certain direction. That's kind of what we're doing with a, a dipole antenna is we are squishing the pattern out, but the volume of the balloon, the volume of air that's in the balloon, remains unchanged. All right, volume of air in the balloon is analogous to power. So how does the total amount of radiation emitted by a directional gain antenna compare with the total amount of radiation emitted from an isotropic antenna, assuming each is driven by the same amount of power? How does it, it's the same. It, the amount of radiation is the same. It's just that it's going to go in slightly different directions um, uh, because of the, the way the pattern is impacted. Near and far fields, uh, a directional antenna, when it's first, uh, when radio frequency energy is leaving the antenna, uh, it's in what they call the near field. Uh, it, it's got a reactive zone, uh, then it's got a Fresnel zone where it becomes focused, and then it has a definite pattern. And when the antenna has that definite pattern, that's known as the far field. You can't make any um, pattern measurements in the near field. You have to go far enough away from the antenna, probably a few wavelengths, before the far field uh, develops. So the region where the shape of the antenna pattern is independent of distance, that's the far field. Uh, pattern measurements can't be made in the near field. I, I like this slide that Dave Kassler had, um, which showed interference patterns. And if you notice here, this is kind of a confused region uh, here. This is the near field. But as the interference becomes constructive, you can see that you develop a pattern going up in this direction, or in this direction. And these are these are far field patterns. This is the near field inside here. So we talked about antenna feed point impedance, and we mentioned that height uh, has a, a big factor uh, on that. Also, conductor length, so trimming the antenna will have an impact. Conductor diameter will have a, 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 a say on a feed point impedance. Uh, and also nearby conductive objects uh, can uh, affect feed point impedance. These are all things uh, to keep into mind. So a full length half wave dipole antenna is probably going to have a pretty good what we call bandwidth or standing wave ratio bandwidth. Uh, here for example is um, uh, something for uh, the 20 meter band, 14 megahertz up to 14.3. Uh, this antenna's standing wave ratio bandwidth is below 2 to 1, uh, almost all the way through the entire band. This is what we call a low Q antenna. Uh, Q is, is referring to the reactance to the radiation resistance ratio. Um, and uh, so here's the, the fre center frequency of that antenna. It's the, the lowest impedance a point, a standing wave ratio of 1.2 to 1 in that area. So this is a low Q antenna. But Gary, I don't have all that room to put this full-size half-wave dipole antenna up. What can I do? Well, you can add reactances to the antenna, inductance or capacitive reactance, but by doing so, you create something called a high Q antenna where 
it will get down to 1.2 to 1 at a certain design frequency, but notice the bandwidth of the antenna is markedly smaller. Now, this is a pretty extreme case. This is probably a mobile antenna. Uh, but the with a higher Q antenna, the trade-off is bandwidth. The antenna bandwidth is defined as the frequency range over which an antenna satisfies a performance requirement. Well, most of the time, our performance requirement is that the antenna have a, a standing wave ratio uh, below 2 to 1, because uh, our, our solid-state uh, transmitter will be happy if that's the case. So antenna bandwidth is generally considered to be the standing wave ratio bandwidth. Um, and if we'll talk more about uh, but if an antenna uh, is below its, if you're below its resonant frequency, then the antenna is said to be capacitive. Uh, if you're above the resonant frequency, the antenna is said to be inductive. Uh, these are the reactances that are they're acting uh, on uh, the antenna at that point in time. And antenna system impedance is made up of inductance and capacitance. And at the resonant point, uh, the reactive uh, portion of the capacitor, the capacitive reactance and the inductive reactance will cancel out. And you're left with radiation resistance, which is what uh, um, actually sends your signal out into space, and ohmic resistance. Um, these are bad connections, corrosion, uh, that actually will generate heat and waste uh, some of your power uh, uh, as far as uh, that. So um, we want maximum radiation resistance we want minimum ohmic resistance, and ohmic loss is, is the bad R. We don't want that. You don't want connections like this. You want them to be clean, shiny, uh, and, and solid. The good R is radiation resistant, and it's defined as the value of resistance with the, that would dissipate the same amount of power as that radiated from an antenna. Some people say that an antenna is, is a transformer, the impedance of free space is 377 ohms. And what the antenna does is it's transforming the 50 ohm feed point impedance or 73 ohm feed point impedance up to 377 ohms to be able to be radiated uh, out uh, into space. Um, these are simplifications, but I just want you to, if you see that as a reference, that's what they're talking about. Gary? Yes. I'm sorry. Sure. That, this seems counterintuitive to me. I don't know why I struggle with that. When you say that you want high radiance resistance. Well, to me, it seems like a pushback. But if you want that. Well, uh, versus ohmic resistance. Versus, because uh, ohmic resistance doesn't do any work. All it does is heat connections. It heats the, the wire there or that braid or whatever. You, you want good solid connections. That's, that's what we're getting at. Um, radiation resistance is the, uh, it, it's as if you put a resistor there um, and it's doing the same amount of work uh, as the antenna is, is radiating out into the atmosphere. So, so you have two, two things that where you're matching impedance in. Your radio to the antenna that transfer the most power and then when an antenna's tuned right, it's the antenna signal leaving to the atmosphere around it. Correct. To get the most power out, ultimately. Yes, correct. Away from the antenna. Exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, so we'll, we'll talk more about this. Um, here's another slide, for example. Um, you want to make sure that um, connections are, are, are tight and solid. Um, you want to eliminate ohmic loss as much as possible. Uh, and um, this is, as we mentioned, the, the good resistance um, that is doing all the work for you. Uh, and here's just another, f yeah. So the, if there's reactance in the antenna, remember it's just building uh, um, magnetic fields or electrostatic fields. It's not doing any real work. The only real work that's being done is by um, uh, radiation resistance um, and you're losing some in, in ohmic resistance. So, again, we have limited amount of time here. We're not going to go deep into that, but I just want to 
you know, introduce those concepts to you. So for vertical antennas, which are typically a quarter of a wavelength high, the way that you improve their efficiency, their ability to operate, is through the use of radials, ground radials or elevated radials. Uh, so these are radials at the bottom uh, of a, a vertical antenna. I have another slide coming here. Remember our flat copper strap that we talked about with grounding? Flat copper strap is good to uh, connect radials together. Uh, it's, it's, it's again because of its surface area, its low uh, impedance to RF current. Uh, also, you can buy these grounding blocks. Uh, you can see this is a flat uh, surface here uh, that distributes the current out to various radials. Um, and on the ground, this is, this is what it looks like. Here's the vertical quarter wave element. And typically the radials themselves are also quarter wavelength long, although they can be shorter or they can be longer. Uh, they don't have to all be equal uh, in distance. It depends maybe what you, you have. If you've got a, a, a hedge over here you don't want to cut into or, or something uh, obstructing or whatnot, you can work around it. Broadcast towers have 180 radials typically uh, around them. For amateur radio, the optimum number has been determined to be around 30, 33 I think it is. But you do what you can do. If the radials are on the ground, that's what you need to do. Elevated radials you can get by with as little as four. And we'll talk about elevated radials here in a second. So back when I was a novice ham and I didn't know any better, my first antenna was a high gain 18V, which was just a, a tall aluminum vertical pole uh, with a coil at the bottom that you would uh, uh, tap into to get the best um, uh, impedance match to your transmitter, my novice transmitter, 75 watts. Uh, and so I didn't have a meter that would, you know, except the one that was in the house. So I'd go in the house, make a test transmission, look at the SWR, then I'd go out and make an adjustment, then come back in, back and forth, back and forth. Okay, my dad helped me put the antenna up. My dad was not a ham. But we knew we had to ground the antenna, and so what we did was we just put an 8-foot copper ground rod in underneath the antenna, and I used the antenna that way for a while. I didn't know about radials. And can ground rods be used in this fashion? Well, they're not very good. I can tell you I didn't work any DX <laughs> from that station. It's better than nothing, uh, but they're poor. Uh, if you're using ground rods, uh, you want to have antenna radials out for vertical antennas. For RF grounding for the ham shack, yes, ground rods are necessary. For lightning protection, yes, ground rods are necessary. But uh, for um, in place of a radial field, no. That's no substitute. So somebody asked about salt water earlier, uh, and it does increase the, the soil conductivity, conductivity typically when you're near salt water. What it does also do is that the low angle radiation of a vertical antenna will increase. The low angle, you have a lower angle of radiation is what we're saying. So, you know, here over ground, this is a side uh, elevation pattern of a vertical antenna. Uh, the lobe goes out here, but over salt water, whoa, notice that. It goes out, so this is salt water gain, and it's why a lot of de-expeditions will set up right on the beach if they're operating from an island, uh, because they get salt water gain uh, for their vertical antennas. Uh, the low angle radiation will increase. Soil conductivity does have a major impact on antenna efficiency, uh, and you can have a very, a you know, conductive soil uh, uh, in uh, millisiemens per meter, um, or you can have very poor soil. South Carolina, where I am, has generally poor soil conductivity, uh, but it does have a major impact on antenna efficiency. Here is a national map. This is the URL for this. You can find where you are and what the kind of conduct conductivity readings are in your region uh, from excellent that's the darker areas here to very poor. That's the, the white areas. Verticals over a poor ground are going to have an elevated or a higher angle of radiation. So here's, here's perfect. 
here's very good, here's, here's very poor. It's going to have a, a radiation uh, pattern up in, in this way right here. So verticals over poor ground are going to have a, a high angle of radiation. We talked about the, the isotropic radiator and the dipole antenna, and the dipole has a 2.15 dB gain over the uh, isotropic. Um, well, here it is again, uh, and the ratio of the radiated signal strength of an antenna in the direction of maximum radiation to that of a reference antenna, that is the definition of antenna gain. And manufacturers will specify, if they have an antenna that has gain, they'll specify gain in either dBi, dB over an isotropic radiator, or dBd, uh, decibels versus a dipole antenna. So you need to know this difference in gain uh, in order to compare apples to apples um, because uh, an antenna that uh, has gain versus uh, an isotropic is always going to have a gain number that's 2.15 dB higher uh, than a, uh, one that's referencing a dipole antenna. You get more gain, but you give up beam width. Um, so... If you have a multiple uh, element Yagi antenna, for example, three, four elements, you may have more gain in a certain direction. So you may be able to work that DX antenna, uh, that DX station uh, um, you know, away from you because it's got more gain in that direction. However, if you're a contester, you want to work maybe a wide region uh, of signals. Well, maybe you want just a two element antenna. It has less gain, but it has a wider beam width, so you're going to hear more stations without having to move the antenna. More gain equals a narrower beam width, and you have to decide uh, what it is that you want to do. Uh, are you contesting? Are you DXing? Or what is it? You'll see these patterns being provided by manufacturers, uh, and uh, they may ask you, what is the 3 dB beam width? of this antenna. What is the, the half power point? Well, if we notice on this scale up here, there's the 3 dB below reference. This is the reference line. 3 dB below, 6 dB below, 12 dB below, 24 dB below, and it corresponds to these circles that, that go out here. So if we put the maximum um, output of this antenna, the, the peak point here, on the reference line, and we go back, the 3 dB point is going to be here on this side and here on this side. So what is this angle between here? Well, here to here is 60 degrees, so it's a little less than that, so we're going to say about 50 degrees. In this case, the 3 dB beam width is about 50 degrees based on this uh, polar uh, plot. You can also use these to determine the front-to-back ratio. So again, the, the main uh, lobe is on the, the reference line here. And the rear lobe uh, here, well, we have to go over, uh, it's between minus 12 and minus 24. I'm going to guesstimate it's about 18 dB. So reference here versus here, it's about an 18 dB ratio front to back ratio. So this is a side wave look at a vertical antenna's radiation, or it could be horizontal antenna, I suppose. Um, and so how many lobes are there here in the forward direction? One, two, three, four. But the main lobe, the peak lobe, is this one. And so notice it's out on the, the reference line again here. Uh, and normally you measure uh, an antenna's uh, uh, takeoff angle uh, with the peak lobe or the main lobe. So in this case, this is 30 degrees, that's 15 degrees, that's going to be about 7.5 degrees uh, above the horizon at, at that point. Low takeoff angles are best for DXing. Uh, to go to have your signal go the farthest on high frequency bands. And you can use the same chart 
of this elevation chart to measure front to back ratio again. So the, the main uh, lobe here is on the reference line. We go back over here and look at that. And there's the, the reverse. Let's see, that's the minus 30 dB line. So we're going to estimate about 30 dB front to back ratio for this antenna. Another thing you look at is the front to side ratio. So again, you've got the main lobe on the reference line. Look at the side over here. It's between minus 12 and minus 24, closer to minus 12. So I'm going to say 14 dB front to side ratio. And this is what we already looked at before, but with the elevation angle of the peak or the main lobe, we're going to estimate again it's seven and a half degrees. So for those folks who are lucky enough to be up on a mountain, or even uh, on a mountain that is looking toward the sea, this is going to work to your benefit. Uh, the downward slope uh, away from the antenna will uh, decrease uh, vertical antenna's elevation angle. Uh, also, uh, Yagi antenna's elevation angles will, will, will go down. It's better for working DX. Um, and uh, so uh, the best thing to have is to be up on a, a mountain uh, and with the sloping uh, elevation away from you. Uh, that'll give you the, the best chance of, of getting a DX. And there's actually software that you can get with the American Radio Relay League's uh, antenna handbook, um, high frequency terrain analysis. Um, here is, a, for example, a chart of this is the reception pattern over flat ground, the red flat. And at this particular location, wherever they are, there must be sloping ground because this actually is receiving much better than it, were, than it would over flat ground. So we'll talk more about HFTA here in just a little bit. And the height of your antenna is going to have an impact. Um, the lower your Yagi antenna is, for example, the higher the takeoff angle. And remember, we said low takeoff angle is what we want for DX. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can put your antenna this, this low on your roof, and sometimes you have to. It's easier to work on, um, but you're going to have a higher takeoff angle. Whew, we made it through. Let me uh, spotlight you all so you can see these questions here. And you can go ahead and unmute, and let's see what is an isotropic antenna. Charlie, a theoretical omnidirectional antenna used as a reference for antenna gain. That's correct. And what is the radiation resistance of an antenna? Charlie. Do we see that? The value of a resistance that would dissipate the same amount of power as that radiated from the antenna. And which of the following factors affect the feed point impedance of an antenna? Bravo. Bravo. Antenna height for sure, absolutely. And what is included in the total resistance of an antenna system? Delta. Bad resistance and good resistance. Radiation resistance is the good resistance and loss or ohmic loss is the bad resistance. And what is antenna bandwidth? Bravo. All right, Jeff, I'm going to ask you to back off a little bit because I want others to participate. But yes, you're right. <laughs> it's the frequency range over which an antenna satisfies a performance requirement. Normally, that performance requirement, uh, we like to say, is a SWR bandwidth of below 2 to 1. So what is antenna efficiency? Bravo. It is bravo. It's uh, radiation resistance, the good resistance, divided by the total resistance, which includes ohmic losses. Uh, hopefully it'll be one. You Hopefully you don't have any ohmic losses. But if you do, uh, you got to keep them into play here. So which of the following improves the efficiency of a ground-mounted quarter-wave vertical antenna? Mm. 
Alpha. Don't be a dummy like me and just install a ground rod. No, you need a radial system. So which of the following factors determines ground losses for a ground-mounted vertical antenna operating in the 3 to 30 megahertz range? Soil conductivity. Yeah, it's a big, long question for a short answer. <laughs> so how much gain does an antenna have compared to a half-wave dipole antenna when it has 6 dB gain over an isotropic? Alpha. Alpha. So it's going to be 6 dB minus 2.15 is 3.85. So in the antenna pattern below, what is the beam width? Anybody remember? Mm. 50 degrees. 50 degrees. Yep, 50 degrees. <laughs> and in the antenna radiation pattern, what is the front to back ratio? Oh, that's um, Bravo. Which mm -hmm. It is Bravo. It's 18 degrees because um, here's minus 24, so it's not, it's more than that and it's less than minus 12. So. And in the antenna radiation pattern below, what is the front to side ratio? Uh, it is Bravo. 14 dB, yep. You're look, this is zero, this is the reference. And so you, what is this number in here? You're looking, it's not minus 12 and it's not nine, minus 24, it's somewhere in between, it's 14. 14? Yep. And what is the front-to-back ratio of the radiation pattern here? Uh, zero. Bravo. Bravo. 28 dB, excellent. Mm -hmm. And what type of antenna pattern is shown in figure E92? It is an elevation pattern. Gary, can you uh, go back to that last question? Sure. Was the DB on this on the horizontal uh, mm -hmm. line down there at the bottom? Yeah, That's you see it. You see it there, and it, it follows the circles around. Right. So it's minus thirty. Right. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see the thirty, but that back, very back load back. Oh, okay, it's thirty. Okay. Yeah, you see the thirty is in there, and it's, it's a little, less. it's a little less than thirty, so twenty-eight. That's yeah. the closest one to the number. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. And so what is the elevation angle of the peak response in the antenna radiation pattern shown here? Charlie. Charlie. Yep, 7.5 7. degrees. And how does the total amount of radiation emitted by a directional gain antenna compare with the total amount of radiation emitted from a theoretical isotropic antenna, assuming each is driven by the same amount of power? Charlie. They are the same. So, what is the far field of an antenna? Delta. Do we see that? Delta. Delta. It's the region where the shape of the antenna pattern is independent of distance. And how is the far field elevation pattern of a vertically polarized antenna affected by being mounted over seawater versus soil? Delta. Delta. Yep, seawater will increase the low angle radiation. And how does the radiation pattern of a horizontally polarized three element beam vary with increasing height above ground? Bravo. The higher you can get the antenna up, the takeoff angle. Uh, of the lowest elevation lobe will decrease. You'll, you'll go further out. Mm. And how does the performance of a horizontally polarized antenna mounted on the side of a hill compared, compare with the same antenna mounted on flat ground? Bravo. It's bravo. bravo, yeah. The main lobe takeoff angle decreases in the downward dire downhill direction. What happens as the Q of an antenna increases? Okay. 
Low Q antenna versus high Q Bravo. The SWR bandwidth will decrease. Yeah. Lower selectivity, but better SWR. Well, actually, it was a narrower range of FWR matching. Yeah. Right, narrower range. So, which of the following conductors would be best for minimizing losses in a station's RF ground system? Bravo. Bravo. Yep, that flat copper strap. And which of the following would provide the best RF ground for your station? Charlie. Charlie. An electrically short connection to three or four interconnected ground rods driven into the earth. We don't have metal water pipes anymore. We've got typically PVC. No, <laughs> yeah. All right, and ladies and gentlemen, we have made it to the intermission time. We will uh, take now our typical five minute break. You're doing fine. And uh, get up, stretch, <laughs> move around, and we'll see you back in about five minutes. I have a question. Hey, stand by one.
So we are back. Make sure we got some audio going over there. And um, uh, we had a comment in the uh, chat on YouTube earlier that our audio level was a little low, but uh, it's going out here fine. So I don't know. Um, YouTube has had some issues in the past. Hopefully though, they get that rectified. But we're happy to have you with us and hopefully you can hear us okay now. Uh, we're going to continue on uh, with uh, talking about antennas and feed lines uh, with section 9.2 practical antennas. But uh, before we actually talk about practical antennas, Dave, if you go over, uh, we want to first talk about the more important than the type of antenna that you select is, like the realtors say, your location. Your location is, is you know, can be really uh, beneficial to radio frequency propagation. The perfect high frequency QTH is one that's on top of a mountain on an island surrounded by salt water. If you can get that, that's that's a great QTH for high frequency DXing, etc. Another location issue is noise. Uh, you may be in the city and there's a lot of radio frequency noise around. You may not be able to hear anything because of the local interference uh, that's going on. And also we talked about the terrain around you. Um, at my old QTH, uh, Sassafras Mountain, the highest mountain in South Carolina, was uh, just about uh, five, ten miles away from me. Uh, and it was right in between me and Southeast Asia. So I had a very poor uh, ability to get into Japan, for example, uh, where other stations could hear them all day long. I could barely hear them because the mountain uh, was in the way. I have to say that in this new uh, location I'm in now in Anderson County, South Carolina, I no longer have that problem. So I'm looking forward to working many more Asian stations uh, than I was able to do so in the past. But th that's high frequency terrains impact. Um, here's a, a video just so you know about it. Um, finding radio frequency noise quickly. Now that I have uh, my first antenna up here at this new QTH, I'm going to have to go through the house now and find I've got lots of noise sources that I'm going to have to try to eradicate. We won't talk about that tonight, but um, that is a, an effort that you'll have to probably undertake as well uh, eventually. And maybe even more important than location is propagation. If the band is open, you're going to be doing fine. But if the band is not open, it doesn't matter where you are or how low your noise sources are or anything. Um, propagation is absolutely the king. All right, so now we can get back to section 9.2. And we talked about dipole antennas. Uh, they're a half of a wavelength long, typically, so um, feed uh, at the center, a quarter wavelength here and a quarter wavelength here. Uh, does anyone remember the formula in feet uh, for calculating the length of a dipole antenna? 468 divided by the frequency in megahertz will give you roughly uh, the distance in feet. If a dipole is too short for the frequency that you want to operate on, it is said to be capacitive. And it relates to the ratio of the phase angle uh, uh, of voltage to current along the antenna. So too short, it's capacitive. If an antenna is too long for a particular frequency that you want to operate on, it's said to be inductive. Again, due to the ratio of voltage to current and, the, and their phase angle. We're not going to go in depth on that. You can shorten dipole antennas if you don't have the space available by adding inductances, uh, loading coils as they're called here. Um, adding reactants to the antenna will make the antenna look electrically longer. It will Loading coils will cancel a short antenna's capacitance. Remember, we said if the antenna was too short for the frequency that you wanted to use. We said it was capacitant, uh, capacitive, uh, so you add loading coils to cancel that, but it will decrease the overall antenna bandwidth. That standing wave ratio matching bandwidth will decrease. You can find trapped dipole antennas. Trapped 
pipes are not really um, inductors, they're more low pass filters. Uh, and uh, this kind of an antenna, for example, uh, at the highest frequency band, let's say 10 meters, it's just using this portion of the antenna. But go below 10 meters, let's say to uh, 15 meters, the trap here will pass that signal, and so you use the antenna all the way across uh, for, uh, for 15 meters. Um, go below that, and it goes beyond this trap, and it goes all the way out to the end insulators for maybe, say, 20 meters. So this will be a three-band trapped dipole antenna. Note, though, that this style of antenna may radiate harmonics. If you're on 20 meters and you're radiating a second harmonic, well, 14 megahertz times 2 is 28 megahertz. Uh, that would be radiated just fine by this center section. So uh, multiple multi-band antennas can radiate harmonics. This is a trapped dipole antenna. An another multi-band antenna is the fan dipole, also known as a parallel dipole, where you actually have a full-size dipole for all of the bands, and they connect to a common feed point. Uh, these work, I find them to be very fiddly to adjust. They're very difficult, for me anyway, to adjust. But some people have very good luck with fan dipoles. Again, though, this may radiate harmonics. Another kind of dipole antenna is the folded dipole antenna, uh, where you feed it at the center. It goes out a quarter of a wavelength on one wire. Think of this as like 300 ohm twin lead. Um, it goes out on one wire. You connect it up from one wire to the other, and it comes back all the way, all the way, connect it again, and all the way back. This is also considered... Um, it's a folded dipole, but could also be considered a loop antenna. It's a very thin loop, but it's a loop antenna. This kind of an antenna is going to have a feed point impedance of about 300 ohms. So you're going to have to use some sort of transformation to get from 300 ohms to 50 ohms uh, to the back of your, your uh, transceiver. Another multi-band antenna that's pretty popular, and you can find these being sold, is... Uh, designed by a ham from England, G5RV was his call sign. It's a multi-band dipole antenna, uh, 80 through 10. In this case, it's 102 feet long. Um, it's fed from the transmitter with coax, coax, to one-to-one um, -one ball ballon, a current choke, uh, to a section of open wire line, and then out to the, the dipole antenna. A G5RV is a multi-band dipole antenna that requires a tuner and uh, can be difficult to, to adjust, but you need to know about it. Uh, it's fed uh, with coax, uh, a one-to-one -one ballon, to a section of open wire line, finally to the antenna. That's a G5RV. If you ever go to the uh, ham fest in Friedrichshafen, Germany, Friedrichshafen is the home of this guy, a Zeppelin. Uh, that's where they build them, the Hindenburg and the, the, the Graf Zeppelin and, and the others. Uh, and uh, they had to have antennas for radio communications, so they came up with a ZEP antenna, short for Zeppelin. It's an end-fed dipole antenna and a single-band antenna, uh, usually fed with um, uh open wire line uh, where one side serves as a ground counterpoise and the other is the, the current going to the antenna itself. ZEP antenna is an end-fed dipole antenna, not to be confused with an extended double ZEP. <laughs> an extended double ZEP is actually a, a, it's a dipole antenna that instead of being a uh, half uh, a quarter of a wavelength down here, it's 1.25 wavelengths total, so it's 5 eighths of a wavelength in this direction, 5 eighths of a wavelength in this direction, uh, and you feed it with ladder line uh, with a tuner that has a, uh, a 300 ohm output. It's two 5 eighths elements in phase. You get 3 dBd gain, so this antenna um, will actually uh, double your power output and your reception capability uh, for free. It's an extended double ZEP 
which is two 5 8 wave elements in phase. Now, vertical antennas we talked a little bit about before. They're typically a quarter of a wavelength up, and, and you can make these yourself with wire uh, and uh, just you know run uh, the wire up uh, to a supporting structure, a tree or whatever. Uh, and you can have radials then down on the ground. Uh, remember we said the optimum number is 30 for amateur radio. But one thing with this kind of system, you could have the radials elevated over ground. Now, remember what we said, the feed point impedance of a dipole antenna is nominally 73 ohms. Well, the feed point impedance of a vertical antenna is half of that, or about 36 ohms. And so um, that's still kind of a mismatch to 50 ohm coax. It's close, but if you want to optimize that, one way you can do it is by elevating the feed point of the antenna up in the air it's a quarter wavelength up here, and then having the elevated radials come down toward the ground at about a 45 degree angle, uh, and this will make the feed point impedance 50 ohms uh, without doing anything special. And uh, this is what I did uh, at my other QTH. I had uh, antennas like this for 40 meters and for 80 meters, and they worked very well. So this antenna has a, a natural resonant frequency what happens when you operate below the frequency? Well, um, if you operate below that frequency, uh, it's said to be capacitive. Uh, so radiation resistance will go down and capacitive reactance will go up. If you operate below an antenna's natural resonant frequency, radiation resistance goes down, capacitive reactance goes up. Now, we haven't talked about um, calculating the resonant frequency in circuits, but this is the formula. Uh, it's 1 over 2 pi times the square root of L times C. Uh, so in this circuit, it's, here's the inductance, and here's the capacitance. And if you know these values, you can calculate the resonant frequency uh, of a, a resonant circuit. Well, an antenna is a resonant circuit. And the thing I want to point out here is inductance and capacitance uh, are both, it's one over, it's the inverse. So by adding inductance or capacitance, you lower, if these go up, then you lower the resonant frequency of the, of the circuit, including antennas. So that's how you can load antennas or make them shorter than their natural length uh, by adding inductance, uh, maybe in the middle, for example. Uh, and so if you only add inductance, uh, you have to be concerned about how much wire is being wrapped around here, uh, how much resistance it's going to have. You'd be concerned about the reactance versus the resistance of that device. Um, or you can also add capacitance to the top of an antenna uh, through a top hat. We'll see another picture here in just a sec. Um, by adding a capacitance, you can reduce the size of the inductor. Both are doing the same thing. They're lowering the resonant frequency of the antenna. Uh, so um, with both of, of these, you have a loaded vertical antenna in this case. Typically, the coil goes in the middle of the antenna, although for mechanical reasons, you may have to locate the, the coil lower in the antenna. Um, it improves current distribution on the antenna if you put it in, in the middle. And here's another look at capacitive loading. Uh, here we've got the loading coil at the bottom uh, with a capacitive top hat up here of wires that are, are actually making a capacitor between here and ground. And that capacitance helps lower the, the resonant frequency of the antenna. Uh, if you can do this, if you can put the capacitance up here, you can make a much smaller coil down here. And a smaller coil has a lower resistance losses in it, therefore greater radiation efficiency for the entire antenna. And if you want to put a high-frequency antenna on your car, you can't put anything full-size, so you're going to have to use a high-Q 
loading coil. That's one of these. This is a, a screwdriver antenna because it used the old screwdriver motors to actually turn the coil in here. Uh, and in this case, we want the reactance to resistance ratio to be high. We want low resistance. So you want as big a coil back here as you possibly can get. Uh, a larger coil will minimize ohmic losses and heating loss. This is a mobile HF vertical antenna. Now, you can actually put two antennas together and, and get gain. You do this by using phasing lines. So here's your feed line coming from the radio. Uh, it could be as simple as a T-junction uh, that goes to coaxial cable uh, in, to one antenna and coaxial cable to the other antenna. Uh, now, in this case, you're going to have a, an impedance mismatch, probably, uh, unless you do some other uh, techniques, but we'll talk about that. But phasing lines themselves, the length of the phasing line can be critical. In fact, if we look closely here, this, this one is 22 inches, and this one is 16 inches. Uh, I'm not sure exactly uh, what this is for, but these are called phasing harnesses, and their length is critical in getting the right signal to the right antenna in the right phase. Phasing lines ensure that each driven element operates in concert with the others to create a desired antenna pattern. And so this is kind of uh, one of those antenna arrays that you might uh, be able to use a, a phasing line uh, arrangement to feed both of these antennas together and, and get a 3 dB gain because you've got uh, two antennas instead of one. One way you can match impedances with antennas is something called a Wilkinson divider. Uh, they make them for VHF, UHF that look kind of like this, or for HF uh, can look like this. It's a power divider circuit that uh, can achieve isolation between the output ports while maintaining a match condition on all ports. So 50 ohms here, 50 ohms for this antenna, 50 ohms for this antenna. That's a Wilkinson divider. All right, there are... I don't know why they want you to know about um, phasing vertical antennas. This is what they do in broadcasting uh, for uh, uh, AM broadcasters who have to protect um, other stations on nearby frequencies. They'll make them, instead of having an omnidirectional pattern, they'll make them put up multiple towers and have a directional array. Well, you can do that on the HF bands as well. Uh, and so there are some test questions about it. If you look on page 9-17 of your book, you'll see all of these patterns. And I'm sorry, my diagram's a little crooked. Um, we've got here 15 different patterns. We really only need to know about three. So if you put a little check mark by this one, this one, and this one, and if you look on the diagram where they're talking about um, the antennas themselves, the vertical antennas being fed either in phase, 90 degrees out of phase through a phasing harness, or 180 degrees out of phase through another kind of phasing harness, uh, and the patterns that result. Note the antenna orientation in these diagrams, all these diagrams, is we're looking top down. Here's one vertical antenna, and here's the other vertical antenna that are separated uh, by a certain distance. And the distances are either um, an eighth of a wavelength, a quarter of a wavelength, a half of a wavelength, three quarters of a wavelength, or one full wavelength of separation. So consider these three cases of quarter wave vertical antennas. And I'll try to make this as easy for you to remember as possible, but there is going to be probably some memorization. So for phased quarter wave verticals that are spaced a half wavelength apart and fed in phase, the result is a figure eight pattern broadside to the axis of the array. So here's one antenna. Here's the other antenna. We're looking top down. And they're separated by a half wavelength apart. And they're fed in phase. And you'll get this sort of a pattern coming from the, this two antenna array. So in phase, you get a broadside pattern. Phase quarter wavelength verticals, again spaced a half a wavelength apart, but fed 180 degrees out of phase, results again in a figure eight pattern 
along the axis of the antennas. So here's one antenna, here's the other antenna, and the pattern is, is this sort of figure eight. So 180 degrees equals a figure eight on axis. So we said before, in phase was broadside, 180 degrees is on axis. And the final one we need to know about is if you feed quarter wavelength apart, fed 90 degrees out of phase. This is a unique pattern. It's a cardioid pattern. Or if you look at this upside down, it's the shape of a heart, cardioid. So remember, if you're feeding it 90 degrees out of phase with a quarter wavelength spacing, it's going to be a cardioid pattern. And these, are, these are the three that you're going to want to know about. You can go back over this and find your own memory trick to help you remember. Long wire antennas were a thing and still are a thing. Just one general principle to know that as a long wire antenna gets longer, the lobes of the antenna align more closely with the direction of the wire. So the longer you have an antenna, the, the more the lobes are going to be lower in angle and align more with the direction of the wire. That's a long wire antenna. All right, do you suffer from OCFD? <laughs> well, okay, that's a takeoff on OCD, but um, off-center fed dipole antenna. Some people will call these Wyndham antennas, um, maybe erroneously. An off-center fed dipole is a multi-band antenna, and it typically requires a traditional, a, a good four to one or six to one or even larger ballon at the feed point. Uh, this is a, a balance, a balanced to unbalanced transformer that transforms the impedance 50 ohms here to 200 ohms or 50 ohms to 300 ohms. So center fed dipole, we feed it right in the middle and it's uh, 73 ohms, which is a pretty good match for 50 ohm coaxial cable. Off center fed dipole, it's a half wave dipole for the lowest frequency band of use. So for 80 meters, it'll be about 130 feet long. But you feed it at the one-third point. So one-third of the antenna is here. Two-thirds of the antenna is here. And you feed it with a ballon and coaxial cable. This is an off-center fed dipole antenna. Another look at it is, is over here. Uh, the feed point impedance, they say, is going to be in this range. It could be even more, depending on um, height above ground. <clears throat> and uh, it works at the fundamental frequency, the, the length of the antenna, so 80 meters, uh, 130 feet, and it'll work at even harmonics. So it'll work for 80 meters, 40 meters, 20 meters, and 10 meters. This one antenna will work on all of those bands. And probably going to require an antenna tuner. Uh, they say you can do it without, but I tell you, you probably are going to need one uh, to, to um, work out some inconsistencies. So that's a classic coaxial fed Wyndham antenna. It uses a current ballon. Uh, there is a current ballon and a voltage ballon, two, two different kinds. Um, so that's the classic coaxial fed Wyndham. A Carolina Wyndham is a special variety. It uses a voltage ballon here instead of a current ballon. Um, and it actually has coaxial cable here with a one-to-one -one ballon here. <clears throat> this antenna radiates along here, from here, and from the vertical element. I just point that out because you'll see these advertised. And I just want you to know the difference. Sorry. <clears throat> sinuses. This is what you want to have in your backyard. <laughs> your HOA won't like it, though. A rhombic antenna. We used to use these in Voice of America at, at receiver sites and at transmitter sites. These antennas have about a 15 dB forward gain. They're big antennas. Uh, they're, you know, full or multi-wavelength antennas up on a large uh, super structures, poles, towers, what have you, <clears throat> you feed it at one end of this uh, um, rhombus, uh, comes in here and is fed out and down, out 
and down. And you can either leave it open at the end, and that will be the antenna will be bi-directional, be in this direction or this direction. If you leave it open, or if you connect a, fifth, uh, a, a loading resistor here, I'm trying to remember, I think it was 200 ohms. Um, if you terminate it into a resistance, it could be nichrome wire that's down on the ground, uh, which is what this is showing you here, um, then it makes it a unidirectional, only bidirectional in that direction. Uh, but 15 dB gain, that's nothing to sneeze at. Uh, and you could have a really powerful signal. That's a rhombic antenna. And when you terminate a rhombic uh, into a particular load, uh, it makes it a single direction antenna. Very high gain antennas are parabolic, parabolic dish antennas. They focus radio frequency energy to a certain point uh, where you actually have a collector uh, an antenna there uh, to receive the energy that's being collected. Parabolic dishes can be used uh, for UHF and above. Uh, they're very high gain, 50 dBi, for example. Interestingly, as you go up in frequency, if you don't change the size of the antenna, but if you just go up in frequency, the gain varies by the square of the frequency. So if you double the frequency, you get 6 dB of additional gain uh, on a parabolic antenna. Here's a Yagi antenna, uh, which we uh, can use for HF and also VHF, UHF. It's a directional antenna. It's what they call linear, linearly polarized. Note that it's got um, uh, a near field here, and then it has a far field out here where the pattern uh, is uh, directional. Uh, and not so strong in the reverse direction, so that's what this is constituting here. Uh, it's Yagi antenna with a director, the driven element, and a reflecting element as well. And here's a three-element Yagi antenna. And you can use Yagi antennas for circular polarization. If you remember, we said circularly polarized antennas are good for satellite reception. Uh, and you can uh, make a circularly polarized antenna out of two Yagi antennas by mounting them perpendicular to each other and feeding them 90 degrees out of phase. And these uh, are used for amateur radio satellites. Here's an interesting slide, um, which I'm not exactly sure where I got it from, uh, I think from the Flex Radio Forum, um, that talks about um, radio frequencies. Okay, down here, this is frequency on the horizontal axis. Uh, and noise levels in dBm, depending on where you are, whether you're in a residential area a rural area or quiet rural. So for operating in bands below 10 megahertz, note the, the noise levels come, come up considerably, especially if you're in a residential area. Uh, they, they've drawn in here uh, corresponding S meter levels. So uh, noise levels uh, for, let's say for um, uh, 80 meters, for example, down here, uh, in the residential area is going to be like uh, S, uh, almost S7, S6. The thing to point out here is that on these lower frequency bands, especially for 160 and 80 meters, atmospheric noise is going to be so high that for receiving that noise, uh, that uh, noise is going to be so high that gain is not important. Uh, so for receiving antennas on these bands, we don't so much care about um, getting gain as we care about eliminating noise. And so we're looking for an antenna that has a received directivity factor, uh, which is defined as the gain in the forward direction divided by the gain in all other directions. That's, that's one thing, but we also want something that will re, re, um, reject noise. <clears throat> There's lots of different things, and here's a, a URL you can take a look at. The high Z antennas has these comparisons uh, of patterns for um, beverage antennas, which is a type of receiving antenna, the K9AY loop, a pennant antenna. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, their um, high Z two element antenna and, and some of their other multi element antennas. 
This is a Waller flag receiving antenna. And both Dave and I know somebody who's got one of these. Dave, K4SV, has got one of these, and it's a directional receiving antenna. It's on a rotor. <coughs> I believe it's in the plane of the antenna. And so you can see it's, it's two loops uh, that uh, are fed, uh, and um, you can use it uh, for receiving 80 meter, 160 meter signals. Uh, it rejects noise. That's one of the nice things about the Waller flag. A pendant antenna is very similar, where that was a loop uh, on each side. Here we have a, a, a delta loop uh, here, a triangle on this side and a triangle on this side. <coughs> this is a 900 ohm impedance antenna, so you have to do some impedance transformation. But again, this is another type of antenna that can be on a rotor and be rotated, used for reception on the very low frequency bands. And our old favorite, the beverage, named after Harold Beverage of AT&T. Um, it's a traveling wave antenna where signals come in uh, from a receive uh, from a point where you you have the antenna located uh, pointing toward it's re it's terminated at that point in a, a load resistance signals come into the antenna are developed along the length of the antenna and then come out uh, are collected in a transmission line they're very long one or more wavelengths long for a beverage antenna uh, the one at AT and T in Riverhead New York was nine miles long, pointed toward Europe. It doesn't have gain. It has negative gain, but it's immune to noise. And these are really easy to build for hams, uh, beverage antennas. You can even just lie them on the ground. They're called beverages on ground, bog, uh, and they work. Uh, you can hear signals on these antennas that you could not hear on your transmit antenna. Uh, so for 80 meters and 160 meters, beverage antennas, highly recommended. And receiving loop antennas, uh, it's one or more turns of wire wound in the shape of a large open coil. Uh, and for receiving loop antennas, the output is directly proportional to the number of turns and the area of the structure. So larger is better, more turns are better for receiving loop antenna. And if you take this one step further and you shield the loop, so it's inside of a, a magnet, magnetically shielded uh, enclosure here, uh, then um, it is electrostatically balanced against ground uh, and gives better nulls. Uh, so you, uh, it's directional in the plane of the uh, antenna here, uh, and it's bi-directional. Uh, and shielded loop uh, antennas were used a lot by the military, uh, especially in w World War II. But note, it's bi-directional. Uh, it receives in, from this direction, and it also receives from this direction, which I found interesting. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever seen this movie, the movie Midway, uh, that came out a number of years ago. They talked about, in World War II, they were doing high-frequency direction finding, uh, using these kinds of loop antennas, but they had a problem um, there. Uh, they didn't know which way was the correct direction, and they went the wrong way. Uh, they went sent planes out looking for the Japanese, and they went opposite of where the Japanese actually were. So that was a, an oops. Um, but you can add something to these loop antennas called a sense antenna, and when you do that, this happens on aircraft, actually, uh, by uh, adding a sense antenna to a loop system, you can make it unidirectional because it adds a null in, in the false direction. Uh, so you could actually always be going in the right direction. But just wanted to give you some context there. Radio direction finding can be used by stations to try to locate where a signal is coming from. You do that by getting different bearings from directional antennas from two different stations and then, you know, on a map, draw it out and say, okay, we think uh, the guy is right about there because uh, the antenna headings are going to be different uh, from the different locations. 
Um, one thing, you do not want to overload your receiver if you're doing direction finding. Uh, so you use typically RF attenuators ahead of your receiver uh, so that you don't overload or get false peaks uh, from your, your radio. You use, a, uh, this is a step attenuator that you might put in. And another thing that's good for direction finding, remember that pattern we talked about, the cardioid uh, pattern? Well, it has a single very sharp null right here. And so if you can make a, a antenna system with a cardioid pattern and you can rotate it and point it, you can use this for direction finding. It's very useful. Oh, we made it through to some questions. Let me spotlight it so you can see them a little better. Go ahead and unmute and tell me what you think. What is the radiation pattern of two quarter wavelength vertical antennas spaced a half wavelength apart and fed 180 degrees out of phase? Delta. It is delta. It's a figure eight oriented along the axis. So remember, 180 degrees is along the axis. And what is the radiation pattern of two quarter wave vertical antennas spaced a quarter wavelength apart and fed 90 degrees out of phase? Alpha. That's the cardioid. 90 degrees gives you the cardioid. But quarter wavelength, that's the other difference. Yeah, true, correct. And what is the radiation pattern of two quarter wavelength vertical antennas spaced a half wavelength apart and fed in phase? That's, that's broadside. Very good. Exactly. And what happens to the radiation pattern of an unterminated long wire antenna as the wire length is increased? Oh. Yep, the, the lobes align more in the direction of the wire. And which of the following is a type of OCFD antenna? It is alpha, yep, a dipole fed approximately one-third the way from one end with a four-to-one ballon to provide multi-band operation. And what is the effect of adding a terminating resistor to a rhombic antenna? It changes the radiation pattern from bidirectional to unidirectional, yes. And what is the approximate feed point impedance at the center of a two-wire folded dipole antenna? Oh. Used to be bravo. Notice, notice folded dipole antenna. Yeah. Hey. So it's, it's going to be 300 ohms. That's that really thin loop. Oh, what is a folded dipole antenna? It is Charlie. That's one way to look at it. Typically made with 300 ohm twin lead. So which of the following describes a G5 RV antenna? Hey. Instead of wideband, think multiband. It's a multiband dipole antenna fed with coax and a ballon through a selected length of open wire transmission line. You can buy them pre-made uh, and you, you look in the bag and go, what the heck is this mess? <laughs> but they work. A lot of people swear by them. A lot of people swear at them, though, too. So which of the following describes a ZEP antenna? It is an end-fed dipole antenna, because they can only feed from one end from the Zeppelin. Which of the following describes an extended double Zepp? Um. It's two 5 8 wave elements in phase. And how much does the gain of an ideal parabolic dish antenna change when the operating frequency is doubled? Delta. It's the square of the, the frequency change, so it's yeah, times 4, 6 dB. 
So how can linearly polarized Yagi antennas be used to produce circular polarization? See. Yeah, it's it's two Yagis that are perpendicular to each other with the driven elements at the same point on the boom fed 90 degrees out of phase. And where should a high Q loading coil be placed to minimize losses in a shortened vertical antenna? Absolutely. Near the center of the vertical radiator is the best spot. And why should an HF mobile antenna loading coil have a high ratio of reactance to resistance? Sure. To minimize losses, uh, heating losses in the wire, correct. And what happens to the SWR bandwidth when one or more loading coils are used to uh, resonate an electrically short antenna? The SWR yeah. bandwidth is decreased. And what is an advantage of using top loading in a shortened HF vertical antenna? This was kind of a two-step process. The answer is D. It improves radiation efficiency, uh, and it does this by allowing you to use a smaller coil. Uh, by using that smaller coil, you have less ohmic losses. So the... So a quick quick question about this one. If, yeah. If you see a, a vertical antenna with um, uh, the what do you call it a a, a, ca a hat? Top hat. Capacitance yep. Capacitance hat. Yep. A capacitance hat. Then it's more than likely that that antenna has a coil as well. Very likely. Yes. Yes. Okay. But so here you're just talking about putting a coil on top. Of well, coils typically go in the middle of the antenna. Capacitors top hats are typically last, at the top. The last question, though, was the loading coil. Well, okay, it didn't say either. Okay. Top loading. I thought it's, yeah. The loading can be capacity. Loading Correct. Loading. Yeah, yeah. So what is the function of a loading coil used as a part of an HF mobile antenna? No? Uh, no, sir. If an antenna is too short, if you've got a short antenna, it's capacitive, so it the coil ca cancels capacitive reactance. So what happens to the feed point impedance at the base of a fixed-length HF mobile antenna when operated below its resonant frequency? The radiation resistance decreases and the capacitive reactance increases. And what is the use for a Wilkinson divider? Charlie. Yep. It is used to divide power equally between two 50 ohm loads while maintaining a 50 ohm input impedance. And what is the primary purpose of phasing lines when used with an antenna having multiple driven elements? It is A. It ensures that each driven element operates in concert with the others to create the desired antenna pattern. And when constructing a beverage antenna, which of the following factors should be included in the design to achieve good performance at the desired frequency? Minimum of 50 proof. <laughs> That's Delta. a different kind of beverage. Delta. 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 Yeah, it should be long. It should be one or more wavelengths long. And which is generally true for low band, 160 meter and 80 meter, receiving antennas? Alpha. Yep. Yeah. Noise Alpha. is so high that gain over a dipole is not important. And what is... If you have gain, you're going you're gonna to increase the noise too, right? Typically, yes. Yep. And what is receiving directivity factor? A 
I didn't properly explain this probably. It, it's D, actually. It's forward gain yeah. compared to the average gain. Uh, over the entire hemisphere of the antenna. So forward gain versus average gain is the receiving directivity factor. And what is an advantage of placing a grounded electrostatic shield around a small loop direction finding antenna? By adding an electrostatic shield Problem? Yes, it eliminates unbalanced capacitive coupling to the surroundings. It, the antenna then only responds to magnetic fields, uh, and it proves the nulls. And what is the main drawback of a small wire loop antenna for direction finding? Alpha. Think about midway. Yeah, it has a bi-directional pattern, and you can go the wrong way. And what is the triangulation method of direction finding? Charlie. 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 Yep, it's antenna headings from several different directions, locations uh, that are used to uh, find the signal source. And why do you use RF attenuation when direction finding? Um, uh, Delta. Delta. Yeah, you want to re prevent receiver overload. Yes, indeed. And what is the function of a sense antenna? Hey. Yep, it modifies hey. that bi-directional, the direction finding antenna array to make it um, a unidirectional. Oh. It provides a null in one direction. And what is a pennant antenna? B. It's a small vertically oriented receiving antenna consisting of a triangular loop or loops. Uh, terminated in approximately 900 ohms. They aren't so small. They're, it's about the size of a car, but you know, they say small. So how can the output of voltage of a multiple turn receiving loop be increased? If you're just using a receiving loop antenna? Delta. Yep, you, you increase the number of turns or you increase the size of the antenna. And what feature of a cardioid pattern antenna makes it useful for direction finding? Bravo. Bravo. Yep, a very sharp single null. So we are at the end of chapter 9, part 1, but wait, there's more. I have some things that I'd like you to maybe check out on your own because I can't share them in this presentation. There are some YouTube videos, physics videos, by Dr. Eugene Kurtoryansky. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, and here's his YouTube channel down here at the bottom. Uh, and I invite you to go take a look. He's got some wonderful animated videos that are professionally narrated on such things as transmission lines, uh, reflections, uh, grounding and shielding. Uh, they're just amazing and wonderful. Uh, I contacted him by email one time and asked him if we could share these videos uh, here in the class, and he said no. <laughs> so I have to point you to his channel so you can go take a look at them over there. But they're really good. Also, this uh, YouTube video, uh, it's part of the Ham Radio Now program from uh, Gary Pierce. Uh, it's standing up for standing waves. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, review of um, transmission lines, standing wave ratio, uh, and uh, the use of antenna tuners. Uh, it's, it's about 90 minutes long, uh, but well worth it uh, for you to take a look at. I highly recommend it. And now you can keep calm and go home. Oh, wait, you already are home. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions before we conclude tonight? All right, so next week we will finish off uh, Chapter 9 uh, with the last three sections, and I will induct you uh, into the order of the Smith chart, which is a very sacred uh, thing, so uh, come reverently uh, to class next week. Till then, 
Let me say 73 and wish you all the best. Anything Happy from you, Dave? Thank you, Gary. Thanks for your time, Gary. guys. All right. Yep. Nothing new from me either. So next week is Gary. See y'all. Good night. Cheers. That's all, folks.